Hello and welcome to Bonus Action, a Duels in Mana Dorks supplement podcast. I am Connor. I'm one half of the Dungeon Bros. Uh, we are not brothers, nor are we in a dungeon. It's a whole fucking thing. I, bu- I, biff- I biffed it up a second time. This is the second ch- attempt at an intro. Don't. I don't really... We recorded yesterday and I'm, I'm still fried from that. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this for how many years now? 77 episodes now and, uh, and that's, several that's extras. what you do with our and- intro. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's fine. We're we're not too worried about it. We're not too worried about it. the bonus actions are all more casual anyway. It doesn't really matter. We're here to talk about Duskmorn with our good friend, typical Gemini Wyatt. Hello and and welcome to the podcast yet again, sir. Yeah. I'm basically like the official third dungeon bro right now. You you are a dungeon lad for sure, you know, okay, in <laughs> like the the Robin we are all to brothers a, in this dungeon. In this yeah. dungeon. Who? Oh, in this in this dungeon, we are all brothers. Uh, but yeah, we have we have the the immaculate typical Gemini here, uh, a budget deck brewer galore to talk about Duskmorn House of Horror, the most recent set that has come out for Magic the Gathering, and who boy, what a set! It is definitely not my cup of tea in terms of theming per se. But that is also why we brought Wyatt on because as I'm sure you can tell by the shirt. Uh, much bigger, much bigger spooky fan than I am, and Sam's more of a spooky fan than I am too. What do you What do you guys think of the vibe? Uh, we'll start. We'll go to Sam first. What What do you think of the vibe of of the horror set in general? I think the vibe is immaculate. There are so many cool cards. There are so many like the mechanics are great too, and like the art is just. Man, they 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 really nailed it with a lot of the art and a lot of the references. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I love the. I specifically love how they did a whole lot of uh, like two versions of the same art, where they they put the little creepy thing in the background for a ton of the cards. Uh, typical Wyatt Gemini, sir. What what's your what's your what's your key in on on the on the theme of this? Obviously, you're you're the big horror buff between the three of us. I feel like they they killed it, like literally, metaphorically, in every sense of the word, uh, because it's it's definitely going to be one of those things that is divisive, like when people look back on it, because you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like as someone who is a huge fan of horror movies, a big fan of Ghostbusters and uh, other 80s slasher films and stuff like that, it, it's it knocked it out of the park. For me personally, this is one of the few sets where they did everything right. The secret layers, the treatment of the cards. They brought in people who did the covers for Goosebump books to do mm-hmm. the uh, big release thing that, like the the movie poster I don't know cards. Exactly what it's called. Yes, the movie poster cards. And then you have the ones where like certain cards are attacking you. Mm-hmm. Uh, just man, the art, the flavor. Everything about and even the power level of the set is really really good. So I will I just say think that's it, it's a slam dunk all around. That is a big point that I want to say. The power level in particular of this set of just like I'll, I feel like there's a lot of cards that are just going to kind of become somewhat auto includes for certain decks and certain strategies. There's even like I I would argue a couple of cards that are going to become like fringe CEDH CEDH staples in certain decks. Like it's there's a lot of powerful stuff. Um, before we get too deep into what those cards might be, we should probably go over the set mechanics for Duskmorn House of Horror. All sets for Match the Gathering tend to have four or five mechanics that a lot of the cards are built around, a lot of the archetypes that kind of mesh well together. We first have Survival. Uh, this is a new set mechanic. It is if a creature is tapped at the beginning of your second main phase, it gets some kind of additional benefit. Uh, in the case of, for example, what is it? The Acrobatic Cheerleader, the one that like everyone hates because it's like, oh, Oh my god, that's so cringe. Uh, I believe it's, if it's tapped, it gets yeah. a plus one, plus one counter, or flying, or something. It basically, it wants you to tap your things, and then go into combat, possibly tapping them to attack in combat, and then getting a benefit if they survive combat. You know, survival in combat. And of course, people are... are messing around with that, and there's a whole bunch of tapping effects for your own creatures to get benefits out of that, too. Uh, very combat oh, oriented. Oh, people oh. breaking the mechanic of how it was supposed to be used in some other way? Who could have thought, right? Hold on now. Hold Magic on. players don't do that ever. Never once. 
Uh, two mechanics that kind of go hand in hand here. We have a new enchantment type with the room enchantments. Uh, they are two, they're, they're cards that have two halves and you can cast either half and unlock that room as it's called when the enchantment enters the battlefield and get the effect. And then while it is on the battlefield, you can pay the mana cost for the other half of the enchantment and get that other halves effect. Uh, usually these are enters effects, uh, some for most of the commons and uncommons. And then, uh, when you get to the higher rarity enchantments, they tend to have more static effects that are lingering. And if you can unlock both halves, you tend to get a little bit of synergy between the two. Uh, the other one that goes along with Which that is, is just odd because, uh, I always got yelled at for leaving the door open. So. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right, all right, right. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do like the one scripted part that I have here. Why? I, I, I don't I'm need, sorry. I don't need I'm you sorry. out. I don't need you outweighing, like, I'm outdoing our here. humor. I'm riff late no that's fine i love it i love it uh the uh, the mechanic that goes hand in hand with that is the eerie mechanic which is kind of uh, an offshoot of constellation from the theros sets uh if an effect you would get an additional effect from a creature whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield or when a room enchantment becomes fully unlocked so both halves have been paid for um, the last two mechanics also kind of go hand in hand. We have Manifest Dread. Uh, this is kind of a combination of the Manifest ability and Surveilling. Uh, so you look at the top two cards of your library, you put one of them onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature, and then the other one goes into your graveyard. If the face down card is a creature, you can pay its mana cost to flip it up at any time. So you can do that at instant speed. Uh, and then Delirium, so cards that will get an additional benefit or an additional effect if there are four or more card types in your graveyard. Uh, those are Creature, Planeswalker, Instant Sorcery, Artifact, Enchantment, Battle, and Land. So those are our core set mechanics that we're building around. Why Are there any ones that really stand out to you, particularly thematic, particularly powerful, ones that you would want to play with? So I personally love that they brought Delirium back for this set. Um, and because the first, when I started playing Delirium, was coming back as a mechanic in the first place and it was so hard to get delirium online in like a, a draft environment there this set though i feel that that's way different it's it's so easy to get the delirium turned on and to really start cashing in that value so i think that they really looked at what was a mistake there and fixed it going forward the rooms are super thematic and i think most of them are very very powerful and the only one that I'm kind of off on is the Manifest Dread because oh. Morph and Disguise, we've got this several times now. I will say, though, I know we're not probably going to cover it too much, but the Commander Precon, the, the mm -hmm. Civic one that focuses on Manifest Dread, just yeah. cracked, cracked beyond belief. Being able to just oh, yeah. flip stuff up. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Crazy. I my one of my favorite commander decks that I've built this year uh, from newer cards was Yaris Royal the Old Gods from Murders of Karloff Manor. And the, I feel like there's so many Manifest Dread cards that are kind of like automatic includes in that deck. And I've been pulling out a bunch of stuff and adding a bunch of the random Dustmorn cards. I really liked Manifest Dread personally. Sam, are you are you are you in agreement with Wyatt about the kind of overload of these face down cards, or or do you not really give a shit? <laughs> uh, so I actually think that I kind of agree with Wyatt in the sense that it came uh, the Manifest Dread cards came very quickly after mm. several other decks this year uh, and other mechanics focused on face down. However. The face down mechanic used to be kind of uh, a little niche, right? There were only so many, especially commander decks, that could do stuff with that. There was DC, and now there's Yaris. But now they're just throwing out even more uh, tools for those decks. So I think that's oh, yeah. pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That Absolutely. I do enjoy. Because I do have a Sidisi brood type like that yeah. I did play. And drawing cards is always fun. <laughs> uh, the disguise was great, but it was just one of those things where I was like... We've seen Manifest in Fate Reforged, we've seen Morph, and then we had Disguise, which gives it Ward 2, and now it's Manifest Dread, so you're picking something from the top of your library, which can be hit or miss, I will admit, but most of the time you're going to find a way to make it hit, and then mm -hmm. you'll have a hidden trick, which is always great. Yeah, I, I just really very like thematic. Manifest... Very thematic. But I do love the Manifest Dread is like... 
um, card selection on top of something that you in a lot at least in commander if you're including manifest dread cards you're probably likely doing some kind of face down strategy some kind of graveyard strategy where you're just trying to get surveil get whatever you can to shove things into the graveyard um but yeah i really liked manifest dread we all we obviously haven't really talked at all about the enchantment synergies i mean we get um we got a a blue, effectively a blue enchantress card with flash. Yeah. Um, the I believe it's the eerie investigator, where just when any enchantment enters, you get to draw a card, and it, it we're open. Yeah, entity tracker. Sorry, there we go. Entity, entity tracker. tracker. Whenever, yes, whenever an enchantment you control enters or whenever you fully unlock a room, you draw a card. Uh, there's also a lot of very powerful auras that have come out in this set, a lot of enchantment synergies as well, particularly in Azorius colors, which we haven't had as much support for. Obviously, white is one of the big enchantment uh, colors, but green and white Selesnya has usually been where we've been getting those enchantment cards. So I like that, I like that we're getting a little bit more uh, from, from the blue side because they've had a lot of fun enchantments that I would have liked to have play with, played with, uh, but I've basically only been building Selesnya decks. Um, survival is thematic in my estimation, but I feel like of the five mechanics, it's quite clearly the, the weakest of the five, in my opinion. Well, I w- I will say, and we've talked about this on the podcast uh, leading up to this set, um, they do have the interplanar race coming up, and yeah. uh, you know, and we just had mounts uh, a mounts uh, theme in uh, uh, oh Thunder, Thunder Junction. Junction. There we go. There we go. Um, cowboys. <laughs> they're cowboys. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I think yeah, you're right. While while overall, like Kona is, I think the strongest of the survival. By far. Far, far and far away, far. yeah. Yeah, not even close. But these these are all going to come up here in uh, in the near future for some probably some very interesting builds. Yeah, you, you bring Absolutely. up the, the racing set that we're getting because of the crew mechanic and saddle mechanic. You're able to tap basically as many things as you want. You can over-crew and over-saddle anything. Uh, yeah, I there there will be some interesting synergies. I feel like the, a lot of this set is just they did a good job of synergies within itself, but kind of synergies as well in the larger scope of what 2024's Magic sets have been and what we can expect uh, toward the beginning of 2025. So I think I think they while the theme is not me, I think mechanically definitely a very sound set in a lot of ways. Um, we'll, we'll get into some specific cards now. Um, I, I want to start off personally with the amount of land love that we've gotten in this set. Cause there's been a ton of love in the land department. We've had two cycles of lands, one of which is a full cycle as well as the first ever enchantment land as well in Valgavos Lair. Wyatt, I believe you have, you have two now that you can show us right there, ready at a moment's notice. <laughs> yeah, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> yes. Was uh, my promo and I pulled one. Oh, I, I I got two Marvins. Say like I feel like I I don't know what they're doing with the seeding of cards in these pre-release kits, but it's it's interesting. Um, <laughs> that's just a conspiracy theory that I've been having for no, a while. I a hundred percent believe in that's that because I've never theory. gotten rares in the colors that I pick. Mm-hmm. So it's always just like I have five different colored rares. I'm like I can't. None of them synergize together, so I'm sitting there just looking at my cards like, I need to draft removal and bombs, and none of them are in the same color, so I can't splash. Eh. Yeah. It's... Uh, pre-release days have not been kind to my draft <laughs> decks. I I feel... I. Yeah, yeah. I, I If if I had built a, a pre-release kit deck out of the card, like, it was all over the place with my pre-release kits, for sure. Um... But yeah, the the, the the enchantment land with Valgavos Lair is a land drop that you can now trigger all of your enchantment synergies. It's kind of an auto include in any enchantress style deck, uh, even though it is a tapped land. Uh, you do get hexproof on it, so people aren't going to be able to use enchantment removal on one of your lands, which is nice. And it can tap for any color, which is also nice. Um, the 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 cycle that I am more excited about is actually the common land cycle that we got we got 10 lands all of the color combinations that are common they enter tapped 
Uh, they tap for one of two colors, but they will come in untapped if you have 13 or less life. Uh, this, I feel like, is huge, it's particularly for, for one, the limited environment is fantastic, and the, it, it's going to be really good for like a popper uh, uh, mana base as well, where in earlier turns, you're kind of like, in, in, at certain power levels, it's more okay to have untapped lands at the beginning. You, you can kind of slow roll a game at the beginning, but once you get into it, or if you're doing effects that like make you lose your own life, having it just it's another un, it's it's the same as an, an original dual land at a certain point. Um, I I'm more into popper now than I've ever been, particularly like PDH and stuff, which is not as relevant because yeah. of the higher life total, but. Um, do you, do you guys see a lot of do you would you see a lot of play from these lands or am I just like looking at it through popper tinted glasses? Uh, personally, I think you could see play depending on the kind like you said the kind of deck that it's put in. If you're if it's something where you're paying life to do X thing, then yes, they could very easily see play because like you said, it's basically a dual land at that point. However, outside of just being a fun thematic callback, I feel to uh, not just Friday the 13th, but to um, Innistrad, where 13 is like this, mm -hmm. you know, big running theme, like Triskaidekaphile and the Tree of Perdition, I believe mm -hmm. it is, uh, just things where 13 is important. I like that aspect of the lands, but expecting to see them outside of that, I just I don't really see that happening too much. Sam, yeah, especially in uh, in our in our main format of commander, you, yeah, with the higher life totals, even if you're paying life out the wazoo, mm -hmm. it's kind of weird to um, to choose to put into your deck something a land for the late game specifically. Yeah, you know, the, there's a reason that the two or, that uh, enters tapped unless you have two or fewer lands. Um, those cards are 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 um, you know just as weird. In the opposite sense, uh, it's the, really mm. the ones that you can choose when they come untapped that you right. need. Yeah, it, if it, they it, had a basic land type on top of their thirteen claws, like it yeah. would be a different story. That would be they, absolutely. But... They, they would be that would be huge if they had the basic land types. I, that's any land that has basic land types. I mean, we were yeah, we've we've gotten the full cycle of all the they always enter tapped, but because they're fetchable. They actually like see a, a decent amount of play in a lot of formats. I think I think Popper is going to love these cards in particular. Oh, yeah. um, it, it's it, it, they have so little access to untapped lands that tap for multiple colors already. So it, having something that has a chance of coming in untapped, uh, one that will, will that will be almost auto include in any deck that it is legal to run them in are the Verge lands. Uh, we only got five of the ten color combinations, but these are lands that uh, do not have any land types, sadly. But they will always be able to tap for one color, uh, and they will be able to tap for one of two colors, yes, if, they ha if you control a land of the uh, two land types. So we have one that always taps for white, but you can get blue. One that always taps for black, but you can get red. Blue, you can get black. Green, you can get white. And red, you can get green. Uh, these are kind of similar to like the tainted land cycle that we got, where you were able to tap for one of red, white, blue, or green, and then as well as black if you controlled a swamp. Uh, but now we have right. more of a broke. We we have it more open in that sense. So. Uh, in my estimation, this is this is a new cycle of lands that I feel like we're going to get the other half of. Uh, I would I would imagine somewhat somewhat soon, and pretty much any deck that is in the colors <laughs> that are that are that you would get the that you would need these lands for, you're going to be running them in. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw them in foundations or, like Sam said, the uh, mm -hmm. racing set coming up but uh it's definitely hopefully not put years out like other land cycle completions have been but this oh, is yeah. phenomenal the only uh the only issue i've heard people talk about is the fact that sometimes depending on on what deck you're playing uh these can be a little hard in the in the beginning in the early game because like mm -hmm. oh i throw down you know another land that doesn't have these land types 
and now I put this down hoping to tap for black, and oh no, I don't have an island or a swamp on turn two, and so now I have the wrong color combination. Uh, but that's that's a very, I think, minor downside for what these are. Yeah. Oh yeah, in Evolving Wilds, a cracked fetch, there's those triome lands that will literally fix almost anything instantly. Oh, yeah. You got Fabled Passage. I mean, there's so many things to fetch the land you need to turn the land on. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I think these are going to be I, most powerful in combination with green because obviously there is so much green land ramp out there that it's like, ah, I need to go fetch two basics or I need to go fetch a forest or I need to go mm -hmm. fetch something that's not a forest in the case of what is it, uh, Farseek? Farseek? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, green's, green's always going to have the, the better draw when it comes to these lands just in general. Uh, I really love the Verge lands. I hope they finish them soon. I like. I really like all the lands. Um, Valgavos Lair is a little bit underwhelming. Um, before we started recording, Wyatt mentioned it's basically like paying one mana for a land to get like enchantment synergies because it enters tapped. Uh, but I, I think they did really good job with the mana base and the limited environment with this kind of a mana base is going to be like very very crispy for sure especially with all the synergies oh. um yeah, two I've more psych bringing a lot of people back to arena honestly oh yeah uh, that is true the draft environment the I, arena has been kind of exploding recently like people are getting very excited for like standard and like like uh, uh, what is what is their version of like Pioneer or whatever the hell I don't know, but like more historic. sixty historic. There we go. Thank you. Um, the I, I, listen. I haven't played. I haven't played arenas in a very long time. I logged on <laughs> recently. So this... <laughs> I logged on recently just to redeem the codes from all the pre-release kits that have been stacking up before I lose them. <laughs> That's yeah. literally the only reason. Um, the only reason I know is because my brain is nothing but a sponge for magic terms, so <laughs> that's just happen to have it. <laughs> <laughs> You've been at it a little bit longer than we have, too, to be fair. Um, oh, yeah, two, to be fair. Yes. Two more cycles that I want to talk about uh, before we get into just kind of uh, going back and forth with some of our favorite cards. Uh, the ley line cycle. Uh, why are we getting more ley lines? Like, I feel like we've gotten a ton of ley lines recently, and they're starting to become not because that ley good. Cool. Ley lines are cool, but we're starting to get effects that just aren't with it anymore. Um, we got ley line of hope, ley line of the void, ley line of transformation, ley line of residence, and ley line of mutation. Um, all of them, except for Leyline of Residence, which is the red one, are like 50 cents ley lines now. They, they don't offer a ton uh, in terms of power. I think the, the best like casual ley line, I guess, would be Leyline of Hope, just getting a little bit of extra life gain, getting some creature buffs. Uh, if you have more than your, uh, seven more than your starting life. Leyline of Mutation is really only good in five color decks. Leyline of Transformation, I. It, it, if you're in blue and you would be running like a a maskwood nexus style effect, I guess uh, leyline of the void is kind of like a secondary effect that is just included on cards that are doing more important things. Uh, leyline of resonance is really the only one that I see I'm seeing get a significant amount of play. Uh, that's the red one. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only a single creature you control, you copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. I've been seeing like a Rakdos prowess deck that's been cropping up in like standard uh, and seeing a lot on arenas as well, where it's starting to like make the make the rise because you run things like Monastery Swift Spear. If you get a Ley Line of Resonance out uh, for free in your opening hand. Uh, and with all the valiant creatures we got out of Bloomborough and now survival stuff too, and all of the like one and two mana buff spells. But outside of that, I feel like this is one of the worst cycles of ley lines we've gotten. Would you agree with that, Sam? I mean, they they're starting to get one. You, they're they're look. I think they're looking to have one very good ley line in each uh, in each different color. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I think the red one here is the is the choice. Um, of course, these aren't necessarily something that uh, I play with personally because in a hundred card singleton format, you know, getting that uh, getting that enchantment 
unless, like you said, unless it's really good, isn't necessarily something that I think about or necessarily want. Yeah, tell that to all the CDH players yeah. running gemstone caverns. <laughs> Well, that's different. <laughs> that is a little different. <laughs> getting getting an extra land on turn one before you've even, or turn zero is pretty yeah. freaking good. <laughs> yeah, even on the chance. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Why do you, do you like any of these? Do these speak to you in any way? Um, I personally like that we keep getting ley lines because Ooh. I just like the possibility of a free spell when we start the game. Uh, not <laughs> yeah. only that. When I started playing the ley lines, most of them, except for like the red ones, which were historically pretty bad, mm-hmm. uh, were crazy expensive. Uh, and I used ley line of abundance in a bunch, a bunch of budget decks because it is like it's four mana, it could be free, and all your creatures tap for an additional green. Well, the ones that tap for mana tap for an additional green. So yeah. it's it's all upside. Uh, so I'm sure there will be specific decks where some find a really good home, and if they want to keep printing them, I I have no problem with it. It helps out with uh, devotion cost, mm-hmm. uh, adding to that because they're usually two pips, so that counts for something. And like Sam said, as long as there's one standout among all the ley lines it they'll continue to be good that is true we talk about uh devotion real quick actually it's interesting you bring up i was noticing i was uh, doing some research earlier and just looking at the top cards from the set obviously like ravnica is known for its two color this is doing a lot in the uh in the mono color work here so many mm-hmm. cards have uh two of the same colored pips um in the case of meat hook massacre 2 there's uh four black pips in the case of the Doomsday uh, Excruciator, there's six yeah. black pips. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, I you got one. Got one. <laughs> nice, nice. And that leads into the two other cycle. I lied earlier. It's three cycles that we need to talk about, not two cycles. The Enduring Cycle and the, uh, the, the Overlords as well all have multiple pips of the same color, too. Uh, so the Enduring Cycle is a cycle of enchantment creatures. Uh, one for each color. Uh, when they die, if they are a creature, they return to the battlefield as an enchantment, so you kind of have to use two removal spells to get rid of them, or you have to exile them to get rid of them. Uh, the red one, you get <laughs> another creature you control gets plus two, plus O, and gains haste until end of turn whenever a creature enters. Uh, the blue one, uh, whenever a uh, creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you draw a card. And uh, the white one, whenever one or more creatures with power two or less uh, that you control with power two or less enter, you draw a card, it triggers only once per turn. The black one, I think, is one of the more interesting and more powerful ones. The um, Whenever you gain life, uh, target opponent loses that much life. And then uh, the green one, creatures you control can tap for one mana of any color, which I think are those two are by far the most powerful in my estimation. Um, a lot of people apparently... The the green one where you can tap for any color, creatures can tap for any color, is the most expensive one. Followed by the white one, uh, when creatures power two or less enter, you get to draw a card. Triggers only once per turn. I think that's kind of the thing that makes it a little more difficult. Uh, but those are also notably the only two that are three mana, as opposed to the rest being four mana. Uh, why does it, do any of these uh, uh, speak to you in any meaningful way? I really I think the design on all of them is pretty cool. Uh, obviously the red one's the worst of them. They got the best ley line, they get the worst enduring creature. <sighs> Poor red, you know. Uh, Never enough good though, red things. Surprisingly, though, as much as people were... I know. <laughs> we got the roller coaster. That's it. Oh, the I got two of those roller uh, coasters. That was my double up. One. And Marvin. Mm-mm. But the red one actually had... I was surprised that people were crapping on it as much as they were because we also got a bunch of commanders that have recently cared about creatures coming in this turn and doing mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. so a, a two power boost and haste is really nothing nothing to scoff at when it comes to that outside of that though yeah it's by far the weakest one i love the fact that if you get rid of them once you still have to deal with them as an enchantment 
Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool because it opens up some scenarios where maybe you use them as a blocker or something, and then you get it back as an enchantment, and that triggers your constellation stuff or eerie stuff again. And um, just the effects they provide, none of them are are weak or no, you know, not at inconsequential. All. And I feel like white and uh, white being one of the mo more expensive one makes sense because white's always desperate for card draw, so <laughs> you take what true. you can get. That is true. That is true. Sam, you yeah, got white, a vibe uh, on this? So with, Sorry. <laughs> I, I, you're good. Uh, so white with white, white weenies is kind of the is kind of the direction they're going in general, and and we've seen you know this the similar effect um, welcoming vampires one mentor of the meek. There are a bunch of these that uh, that white. This is this is kind of how white's getting its card draw these days. Um, mm. I also like these in the instance of board wipes because, you know, e that that turn after a board wipe is that rebuild phase. Some kind of, sometimes can be really sucky because you're like, ah, do I do I you know kind of re ramp with my mana dorks? Do I try to draw some cards? Well, with these, it's kind of like, all right, I already have uh, I had that creature, but now I have the next piece still ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. The board the, definitely helps it, in the recovery. Yeah, a little bit of board wipe insurance is always always a good thing to have. I think I think the enduring creatures are are all very good. I bet the red one would be considered much better if it were one red red instead of two red red. I think that one mana makes mm -hmm. a lot of difference in that sense. Um, it does. The the last monocolor cycle that we need to talk about are the overlords. Uh, the the overlord of the haunt woods, uh, the green one, is one of the first cards we saw from the set that was spoiled. Uh, these all have uh, impending, so kind of a time counter related thing where uh, you can pay a lesser cost. You get them onto the battlefield with a certain number of time counters. You remove a time counter. Uh, while they are on the battlefield with time counters, they are not creatures. And then once the last time counter is removed, they become a creature. Uh, and then you can also pay uh, somewhat exorbitantly high cost to cast them just straight up uh, in the late game if you have. Uh, Over Overlord of the Bale Merc, which is the black one, uh, whenever it enters or attacks, you mill four cards. You can return a non-Avatar creature card or a Planeswalker card from your graveyard to your hand. And then the aforementioned Overlord of the Hauntwoods, uh, whenever it enters or attacks, create a tapped colorless land token named Everywhere that is every basic land type. Those two are far and away the most expensive and the most powerful in my estimation. Uh, $25 for the black one and $30 for the green one, with all of the rest being well under ten dollars yeah the green one having the everywhere land be everything is great for specifically domain decks mm -hmm. uh if you try to build a domain deck that's not five colors it feels like a real struggle because you're trying to mm -hmm. piece together how to like cheat and get your lands to be everything, this is a great way to do it, and I feel it kind of really opens up that design space for brewers to kind of start looking at uh, maybe doing something different with domain. Not only that, it's getting you a land, so that in and of itself is just powerful. And it the impending cost on it, impending four for one green green, so it's a three mana ramp spell, which is very much on rate for your normal kind of green ramp spells. Uh, the the red one, when it enters or attacks, deals four damage to any target. The blue one, whenever it enters or attacks, you draw two, you discard one. The white one, whenever it enters or attacks, you create two, two, one white insect creature tokens with flying. Um, those are just kind of like fine effects. Sam, do you do you do you really like these? Are 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 the prices a little bit overblown, or are they really worth that? The black and the green one specifically. I think that, uh, I mean, honestly, as powerful as they are, and on rate as they are, because mm -hmm. they're both uh, three and two pips for a 6-5 for the green one and a 5-5 five five for the black one. So even if you have to pay full cost, you're not getting, you're, you know, you're not getting a, a, a downside necessarily, um, as well as the fact that they hit the battlefield when you cast them for their impending cost. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not it's not it's you know not an exile like a uh, uh, with a time counter on it. It's you can still interact with it. You can remove those counters somehow, or you know, if you're a, the opposing person, you can proliferate those counters. Um, 
Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of this cycle. I'm also a big fan of how they uh, juxtaposed it against the enduring cycle, since yeah. this is the ultimate evil of the thing, and the enduring are supposed to be the ultimate good. Uh, it's it's the the how opposite they are is very amusing to me. I enjoy it. They're opposite. The they, they came up for it impending, so it's one of those things where it's just like it comes down, and you see it coming. It's like it's supposed to be that feeling of mm-hmm. like, uh I'm gonna have to deal with this at some point. Yeah. The the thematic call out is really really. I mean, in so many ways of just. Like they're they're enchantment creatures, the 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 double pips, the it, it really they they did a lot of good with those two cycles for sure. Uh, those are the three like big cycles of cards that we get from the set. Uh, we're gonna do some call outs for specific cards that we had in mind. Sam, do you have one in mind to to kind of start us off? Sure, I'll start with uh, and I actually pulled this card. Uh, it's the most expensive card in the set right now. And that's the oh abhorrent Oculus. Ooh, uh, it's yeah. It's two and a blue for a for a five five eye, which I believe it's only like the fifth eye printed uh, in Magic: The Gathering. Mm-hmm. Uh, as an additional cost to cast this spell, exile six cards from your graveyard. It has flying, and the beginning of each opponent's upkeep manifest dread. Um, so obviously, being a very low mana cost, uh, it has a lot of a, a you know, sorry. With a very low mana cost, it's not bad when it comes to casting it. However, exiling six cards from your graveyard could be a little hard on turn three. Mm-hmm. However, there are plenty of things that like to reanimate from the graveyard directly to the battlefield for three or less mana. There's plenty of, you know, it's a great otherwise uh, rein, uh, rein, uh, reanimating, reanimation target. As well as when it comes down, it's already going to start doing things as soon as you pass your turn. You know, like a lot of the time, I feel uh, with you know bigger spells like uh, 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 parallel lives or any token doublers, it comes down and you may have spent your whole turn on it. Well, this it comes down and then you pass your turn and now you are getting card selection, filling your graveyard, and you're getting a two-two on the board. Mm-hmm. By the time it gets back around to your turn, you've added three more card. You know, you've added three cards to your graveyard and you've got six power toughness on the board. Plus, this thing's a five five with flying. Like that's not too shabby. Yeah, and in not at all. And in standard as well, I feel like this is going to be huge uh, j- with the card selection, being able to cheat it in. Like blue, blue's going to be eaten good in standard right now for sure with this set. Uh, what? Why? What kind of? What kind of big? What kind of card do you want to? Do you want to call out right now? Uh, I'm going to call out probably my favorite card from the set starting off. And, I mean, a lot of them, a lot of, it was very hard to pick a favorite from this set. Oh, boy. But I'm going to go with what people have been calling Squeaky Jeaky, and I'm going to call out the Jolly Balloon Man. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love clowns. <laughs> oh, and my God. I love making tokens, as I've said before. So being able to make tokens... And this thing, it just, it goes infinite so easy. Like, they previewed it, and within, like, five minutes, I was like, oh, with Corsair, uh, or, uh, Cor- Coro- Cor- mm, I'm trying to, it's a pirate that basically, each time a pirate enters the battlefield, it does what Zealous Conscripts does. So it, t- mm. it gets a target creature, you can target your own creature, yeah. and it untaps it, and each copy you make of that gets a trigger so when another one of those enters if you have a mana dork you untap the mana dork and untap the jolly balloon man and you do it again and you do it over and over and over coercive recruiter there that's it is it. That's yep. its name. i was i was in the process of finding that thank you <laughs> but yeah it was i mean more so me trying to find the way to pronounce the word <laughs> <laughs> fair fair but i mean the the professor of the Telerian Community College did a deck tech on this basically right when the set came out, if not a little bit before the set came out, because it's especially in Boros colors, in Boros colors, the the combos that you can run like this is a combo commander in red and white, which is so weird. And thank God Mm -hmm. they gave this thing haste so you can drop it. And if you have four mana, you Mm -hmm. can just immediately activate it and start going to work and not having to let it survive a turn cycle. 
Yeah, mm. when you brought up CEDH, people have been brewing this as a CEDH commander. And on top oh, of that, yeah. I was so secretly sappy when he dropped that commander deck tech because I had already written the <laughs> script for my Jolly Balloon Man and I was like, oh, this is about to eat. It's about to be so good. I'm going to be one of the first. And then he dropped it and I was like, well, I'll just I'll put that on the back burner for now. I'll let let that one let it go, go away. And then I'll yeah, and I'll do it later. But well, um, yours are also I've usually a lot with them already. Their yours are a lot cheaper already too, so you got that kind of advantage there for the video. I mean, his was still right, like fifty but bucks. <laughs> I've noticed before if you if you drop like something that a bigger creator does right after them if you're not the first you're basically mm -hmm. the last and yeah. especially once a big creator puts their stamp on it yours can kind of get flooded out so i was like oh yeah everyone's gonna be okay. comparing it i'll and... do tyvar yeah tyvar is still that still a great commander yeah. um all right i'm gonna go now i want to talk about the planeswalker that i didn't get the Planeswalker that I really needed. Kaido, Bane of Nightmares, the Demir Ninja Planeswalker uh, that has ninjutsu and is a creature on your turn. Uh, I, I've been working on a Yuriko Tiger Shadow CEDH list for a while now. I want it to be like the first like proper CEDH paper deck that I have. I was working on a Naughty Winged Wisdom deck. And I'm not anymore. <laughs> so, you know. But we we have ourselves We have ourselves a planeswalker that's kind of in the vein of like a lot of the Gideons, where it will be a creature a lot of the time. Uh it gives him hexproof as well, uh, which is just uh, nice to have on the planeswalker on your turn. And his plus one ability, giving you an emblem where ninjas you control get plus one plus one on a plus ability that you can activate right away when you when you ninjutsu him in when you just cast him straight up uh with a zero with a zero mana or a zero loyalty ability to surveil two and then you draw a card for each opponent who lost life that turn and then just minus two to tap a creature put two stun counters on it a little bit of control but specifically the zero and the plus one loyalty abilities on this planeswalker are huge and it seems like uh whoever got to design this card definitely has a yuriko deck because it checks literally <laughs> every yuriko box that there could possibly be. And it's the only Planeswalker of the set, which is notable. So Kaido was not desparked, uh, which we cannot say about a lot of the other uh, former Planeswalkers <laughs> that, uh, that have made an appearance in this set, for sure. Uh, Sam, what do you got? I'm going to... We, we've just talked about a couple of very powerful cards. I'm going to talk about a, uh, a role player here, and that comes in the card Reluctant Role Model. <laughs> this is one in a white for a 2-2 human survivor. Uh, it has the survival mechanic. At the beginning of your second main phase, if Reluctant Role Model is tapped, put it a flying lifelink or plus one counter on it. That's not the important part. The important part is whenever Reluctant Role Model or another creature you control dies, if it had counter on it, if it had counters on it, put those counters on up to one target creature. Mm -hmm. So... White often likes to play with plus one or with counters as is, and we've been seeing a lot more of the uh, uh, token ability counters. This all this plays like a little baby uh, uh, Ozolith. Yep. Yeah. And you know, oftentimes in those decks, you don't want to send your big thing. Uh, we played a game the other night, and it was hard to find a place to swing because it was like, oh, there's Death Touchers over here, and oh, there's another form of removal over here that if I swing it, I'm going to lose. Um, but yeah, even if you swing your large creature now, uh, you can you you have a guarantee as long as he's on the battlefield that you can take those counters and create a new threat immediately. Uh, I currently have him in my Aragorn. Uh, nice. Oh, what is my deck? Hold on. Uh, company leader, the Celestia. Aragorn, one. company leader deck. <laughs> yes. I'm, Wyatt may have a knowledge for like all magic sets. I have a knowledge for the Lord of the Rings set specifically and nothing else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, that's a that the reluctant role model, I got I pulled two of those as two of my I got a lot of duplicate rares from my from my uh Duskmorn packs, but um 
definitely a card that I'm already looking at for my uh, Calyx guide. Is it guided by fate? The the creature one that came out in mm-hmm. Aftermath mm-hmm. for like the, uh, my I've got like yep. my Selesnya Auras deck going on, and he puts a bunch of counters on things. So just kind of like another nice tool to have to, around those plus one plus one counters. I mean, any plus one plus one counter deck is is gonna want this kind of card, and less than a dollar. So fantastic, less than a dollar. fan fan. Don't sleep on it. Never. Never. Really don't sleep in anything in Duskborn because the horrors are going to fucking eat the shit out of your head and skull and face. Uh, Wyatt, what do you got? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I got another one that I was just super psyched and I've already built uh, is Winter Misanthropic Guide. I pulled a winter Uh, as well. It starts. Okay, well, I got to order one. It's. But it starts as like a group hug. (laughs) Oh, okay, mm-hmm. well, thank you for hooking me up. It's a 37-cent it card, like this it's fine. group hug <laughs> mm-hmm. type thing, and you just slowly, you, you fill their hand up. I didn't build it to be mean. I didn't build it to turn on the delirium, but it's gonna you happen. can if you need to. <laughs> it's going to happen, yeah. <laughs> it will happen. But for the most part, I built it to fill people's hands up, and then it plays things like uh, Price of Knowledge, and Viceling that deal damage to players equal to the number of cards in their hand. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the rest of the deck is just filled with things that make you draw cards and punish you for casting multiple spells. And then in the so, late game, you can really shut them down with the reduction to the maximum hand size. Oh, yeah, because there's... I didn't want to say anything, but there's some discard synergies in there, too, that uh, will yeah. hurt if you well, have to discard cards, which you may or may not have to do. Also, if you're drawing enough cards, you're going to be casting enough cards. Things are just going to end up there. You only need four card types. So, yeah. 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 Winter. Winter is definitely one of those one of those like very easily can become assault commander. Uh, But I feel like it's also kind of uh, (laughs) it's the card that we're getting in every set that it seems like it's specifically designed to annoy the casual community specifically. Like we got that with Voya Jaws of the Conclave (laughs) (laughs) in Murders of Card, where like that card is designed to like just crush casual souls. I love Voya, by the way, huge fan of Voya. Um, But yeah, Winter, Winter is awesome. Winter is very, very cool. Um, I've He's got, very cool, and you could tell he was going to be broken because he has ward two, which is yes. how wizards has been <laughs> letting true. people know that cards are broken by giving them ward two. That is very true. That is very, very true. Um, I want to call out the one card that I am building around right now, and it is for popper commander specifically. That is Arabella abandoned doll. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is Boros, red, white for a 1 3 legendary artifact creature toy, and it's printed at uncommon, so it is legal as a commander for PDH. Whenever Arabella attacks, it deals X damage to each opponent, and you gain X life, where X is the number of creatures you control with power 2 or less. Sam, you brought out the weenies comment earlier about the white cards that care about the creatures with power 2 or less. Arabella wants the wide board, the number of instants and sorceries that create just a ton of one ones. The 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 mm-hmm. creature we've been getting a lot of creatures that when you cast them they come with a one one body, uh, just filling the board with a ton of things and then just start swinging and suddenly you're dealing like even even just attacking with her and dealing six damage and then gaining eighteen in a game of commander is huge in Boros, and just kind of like a little bit of a different Boros vibe. I like that it's uncommon. I like building around uncommon legends and doing the popper commander thing right now, and yeah, it's 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 a little bit of a lightning helix on a stick, but a little oh, yeah. better. But a little better than lightning helix, so big, big fan. Big, big fan. Sam! Oh, yeah. I, I'm a big fan, too. Super Ooh. excited, and I just love that that's their haunted doll that's their Mm -hmm. their creepy you know it's their call out to annabelle yeah Mm -hmm. shocker i never would have guessed (laughs) it's not in the name or anything either you gotta be on the nose with some (laughs) of the stuff oh they're they're very on the nose with a lot of the stuff it's crazy uh sam sam yeah uh i'm also going to or uh, i'm going to talk about another 
not legendary creature. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is the Silent Hall Creeper. This mm -hmm. is one in a blue for a 1 1 enchantment creature, a hooer. Um, Silent Hall Creeper can't be blocked. Whenever Silent Hall Creeper deals combat damage to a player, choose one that hasn't been chosen yet. You can put two plus one counters on it. You can draw a card, or you can have it become the copy of another target creature you control. Um, we often talk about how obviously powerful uh, uh, copy or uh, clone cards are. Mm -hmm. um, and while this one, it does take a turn to go around, when you put it down, it's not the most threatening thing on the board. You and you have a you have a second to develop what you need to do. Uh, but the other two modes also are very useful to be able to have a three three that can't be blocked and to draw a card. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of this. Obviously, it's not at the price point it's at, which is about a dollar sixty four. It's not the best clone spell, but it's not a very affordable one for for people who are in uh, in lower power looking to have one of these effects. That's true. That's true. I like that it's a modal. A modal yeah. cards in general, I think, are just like very good at m like any casual deck. Uh, just having the options available to you, even if they're not the best on rate for any particular individual effect, just having that modality to it is is super good. Uh, I think actually, I think that's one of the ones that I pulled and I looked at, and I was like, "Oh, neat!" And I immediately put it to the side because it was not one of like the big <laughs> rares that stood out to right. me. <laughs> All right, Wyatt. Um, I'm going to shout out uh, because I have a Shire Shizo's Caretaker deck that's specifically built on drain and gain mm -hmm. because I didn't want it to be like stack C discard cards. Uh, so I try to like that. And for me, Fear of Lost Teeth is mm. yeah. phenomenal. It it hits the horror vibe that is permanent through like permeates throughout the deck and it does exactly what I want in the Shire deck where it's draining and gaining and it just Oh yeah. the art so good. Oh, it's horrifying. I hate it. It's despicable and awful. Like why does the jaw have <laughs> why we know why the jaw has teeth. Why does the jaw have a mouth that also has teeth on it? Um yeah, no. Uh, they, there's a ton of great commons in this set. Like a ton of great one, one, like one drop, one one. Like that's perfect for that deck. I've I've been wanting to build a PDH version of that for a while. I'm also getting into the whole CPDH thing, which is a whole other any hundred card works. singleton, any hundred card singleton format. I'm now trying to partake in. I guess. Um, well, the how last... are you gonna know what you like if you don't try everything? That's true. You know. That is true. That is true. I'm even kind of looking with with the development of the the Duskmorn being able, putting out like you can now do like Rakdos prowess in standard and like Azorius enchantments in standard and Pioneer and stuff. And it's like I'm kind of I'm like all right. Well, there's some interesting things going on in those sixty card formats too. Uh, the oh, last yeah. the last card that I want to talk about. Uh, at least on my my list. I mean, there's a ton of cards I would love to talk about. Uh, it's actually two cards that go together very well. Uh, say its name in Altenac, the thrice called. Mm -hmm. uh, say its name is the green sorcery. It is a common uh, one in a green. You mill three cards, and then you can return a creature or land card from your graveyard to your hand. It also has the ability, exile this card and two other cards named Say Its Name from your graveyard. You can search your graveyard hand and or library for a, called, a card named Altenac the Thrice Called. Put it onto the battlefield, shuffle your library, you do it only as a sorcery. And then Altenac is <laughs> a 7 mana 9-9 nine, nine trampling legendary creature insect beast. Whenever it becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you draw a card and if it is in your hand and you don't want to cast it, you can pay one in a green to discard it and then return a target land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Uh, even if it is in the graveyard, it can still be searched up by, say, its name later as well. I think that is an, a very cool interaction uh, and it seems, while not like an auto include in anything uh having it's not really ward but you're getting a benefit when your opponents are trying to do something to altenac uh you get to draw a card off of it 
and a seven mana nine nine trampler is pretty damn good rate and you don't have to it's not a dead card in your hand in the early game if you have it too uh building around those two for like a like a a reanimator strategy in general like a golgari something going on there i feel like there's a lot that can really do there and say its name i mean even without the clause for searching up an altanac and getting it onto the battlefield mill three return one thing back to your hand is it's great graveyard fueling like i think I think the design is tasty and delicious on those two. Yes, yeah, very much. It's it's reminiscent of, you know, Beetlejuice or mm-hmm. Bloody Mary or the Candyman and uh, you know, Mulch is a good card. Uh things that mill and let you get stuff back. So say its name is not gonna be dead if you just wanted to play it. Uh oh, yeah. but Altanac itself, great. It's a great card because, like you said, it's never going to be dead. You can, at the very least, discard it to get a land back. And if you're playing in a strategy like that, you're probably going to have a way to get Altanac back. So, absolutely, absolutely, huge fan, huge fan. Uh, do you guys have a ton of cards left on your list? Do we want to just kind of rapid fire, or you got something you really want to okay. talk about? I got two that I really just want to talk about, and then I can kind of just. I'm good after that. <laughs> All right, you can you can right. go this. We'll go out of order this time. So Wyatt, you can go again. Okay, so uh, one that I was super excited. I built. I've got a, a deck tech coming out on it Monday. Toby Beastie Befriender. I got two Tobies uh, it's too. Just... <laughs> it's, it's like, I, I got so many double winner. rares from this freaking set. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, it's all good. The just I've always been a huge fan of the scene in horror movies where the little kid comes up and he's like, "My best friend doesn't like you." And they're like, "Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, little Billy, you know, where's your best friend?" He's like, "He's right behind you." And there's nothing there. And I feel like that's what even though he's befriending beasties which are supposed to be nice, the alternate art for Toby is the kid from Poltergeist. So mm-hmm. love that. And it's so layered in the art, too, because, like, you look at the the basic art for the card, and you're like, oh, that's Monsters, Inc. Just, like, straight up. Yeah. (laughs) Which, in and of itself, is a reference to those kinds of characters, for sure. I feel like the ability on it is just kind of, like, I mean, it's fine. Yeah, but once I get done with it, and they're swinging (laughs) seven sevens in the air... And there's a bunch of them, you know. It's a it's a different story. A Those nice beasts little... are not legendary. They are not. That is true. <laughs> oh God, you're gonna be blinking the shit out of this thing, aren't you? Yes. Oh no. <laughs> I call it blink, and you'll miss it. Oh, there it is. There it is. I love that. Well, I mean, also three mana one one that brings along a four four body that you can also then give. If you have a lot of tokens, you can give all your tokens flying. I mean, that's the rate is totally fine with that. Oh god, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, that that card, that one's a fun one. That one's a fun one. Sam, what do you what do you got left? Uh, well, I also if you uh, the best, I think the best flavor text in this set go to the Beastie cards. Um, mm-hmm. Just go go re- check out any of the Beastie cards. It's not a huge humor set, but there are some good ones, like uh, Bedhead Beastie, I think, is the best. Bedhead Beastie. It had it had heard monsters were supposed to hide under beds, and it did its best. <laughs> if you look at the art for that, it's just massive. Okay, yeah, that's fun. They're also very sad, though, because then you have Patchwork Beastie. Which is, it doesn't know it isn't real. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, now we're just reading. Hold on, flavor text is fun. (laughs) Um, All right, Kona. We talked a little bit about Kona. Oh, so good. We talked a little bit about Kona. The Kona Rescue Beastie. Three green, four three. Survival, it's a good one. Uh, She's got a heart of gold, a nose for danger, and jaws that can pulverize a cellar spawn with a single snap. I don't know what a cellar spawn is, but it's intimidating. Probably something that spawns in the cellar. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It is rather rather self-explanatory, I guess. (laughs) 
<laughs> anyway, uh, I will. I will. I, I'll call out. Uh, this is a card we've actually been seeing for a while. Uh, it was one of the early previews. It's Twitching Doll. Oh, one in yeah. a green for a 2 2 artifact creature spider toy. Uh, you can tap it to add one mana of any color and put a nest counter on Twitching Doll. Uh, and you can, pay, you can tap it, sacrifice it, and create a 2 2 green spider creature token with reach for each counter on Twitching Doll. Activate only as a sorcery. Um, we've been getting a lot of great mana dorks in the past couple of sets, ones that oh, do yeah. more than just tap out a mana. Uh, and what I love about this one in particular is it says, uh, it doesn't say create a green spider for each twitching counter, or nest counter, no, it just each says each counter. So uh, you just start throwing random counters on there and you're going to start getting at lots of spiders. Oh yeah, well, or I mean, green we could... has no way to double the number of counters you put no. on anything, so we have no. nothing to worry about there. Or the tokens, and... they have no way to double tokens either. No. Yeah, uh, I'm just amazed the fact that they made spiders finally be a 2-2. Because historically, spiders are a one-two. Mm -hmm. They got big boots. So, power creep. <laughs> well, they no longer have reach or death touch now. So, is it really power creep? Well, these ones have reach. Do they have reach? Uh, they still got reach. Oh, they have reach. They Shit. Reach. All right. Fuck, I hate spiders. I hate spiders so much. Like, this, this is, this is me being real. That, like, drains you based on the spiders? Like, that can drain your opponent based on the number of spiders you control? Like, I Ishkana, feel like... Grass yeah. Widow. Just... I, I think it's Ishkana. This is this is Connor. This is like Connor the person, not Connor, not Connor the podcaster. Connor the person. I yeah. fucking hate spiders so much, so much. Worst oh, yeah. creature yeah. to exist. Swarmweaver.com. You've already tried building the Shelob deck, and that already upset me to begin with. Now, <laughs> now it breaks my heart that my favorite. Th piece of fiction of all time has an entire section where there's a giant evil spider despise it um yeah yeah no the the twitching doll's horrifying it was one of the pre-release cards i got and i it upset me greatly uh, um <laughs> it man. and marvin and there's such good art for that too like the art itself just looks horrifying yeah. because it's oh, a yeah. ball it's of spiders awful. in the form of a doll all right i i'm i'm ball gonna say in the form of the doll was my nickname in high school <laughs> oh, All right, moving on. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take control now because I've mentioned this Marvin card probably like five times now. We haven't talked about it at all. It's one of the I feel like one of the like big cards that people are talking about. Uh, Marvin Murderous Mimic. It is a two generic mana for a two two legendary artifact creature toy. Uh, Marvin Murderous Mimic has all activated abilities of creatures you control that don't have the same name as this creature. So, kind of like an Agatha Soul Cauldron on a creature, sort of, kind of, a little bit. Colorless, it can go mm -hmm. in any color combination of deck. Uh, two mana, two, two. I, it's got some weird build-around things. The art is another creepy, horrifying doll, this time a marionette puppet, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I feel like there's there's fun things that can be done here. Um, I just wanted to get off spiders, it's, it's mostly. It's even just a... <laughs> Marvin uh, is even just a card that, like, if you have a commander with an activated ability that requires you to tap it, mm -hmm. now you have a second copy of it, basically. Hmm. I wonder if there are any is tap there a ability commander that does that in the set that maybe takes advantage of that. No, not at all. Not at all. None of them. Never not know. Possible one. to know. Yeah, there's no way that can combo into something absolutely ludicrously terrifying. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, White, you said you had one more big one. Yeah, uh, and I lied about that because then I had I saw this one, and that reminded me. Uh, the Dazzling gotcha. Theater prop room uh, enchantment is something that I, I saw, and I was like, oh, my God, this card's going to be, like, a crazy rare in the set. Like, it's going to be expensive, and I look it up, Convoke. and it's, like, 82 cents or something like that because it's creature spells you cast have Convoke. That by itself great hey if that's all it oh, said yeah. i'm fine with that but then you got the prop room untap each creature you control during each other player's untap step you just gave me a seedborn muse for three mana <laughs> yeah. a white a white seedborn muse for three mana at that yeah and again if you're casting cre if your creatures have convoke and you're untapping them in each other player's untap step 
if you have something that could possibly give every creature you control flash, you basically have Prophet of Crufix, which is a banned card. <laughs> that is true. That For is true. a reason. There's, there's no way Build to give... your own Prophet of Crufix at home. There's no way to give any of your cards in hand flash at a moment's notice. There's zero ways of that happening at all. There's no way that that's broken. And I both both halves of that room are very fairly costed. I think four mana might be a little bit much, but you're going to be able to you're getting an effective mana reduction on creature spells after that. So it's very quick to net positive on on the dazzling theater mm. half of it. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the better rooms. We didn't talk too much about a lot of the room cards. I feel like most of them were they're like each half is kind of fine. Uh obviously there are a ton of common and uncommon ones that are just kind of like, "Ah, eh, these are fine for a limited environment." The mythics yeah. are where you really get into like the meat and potatoes of the good stuff uh uh in the in the rooms. I was ta- I'm looking now at Me- Mirror Room and Fractured Realm I've been hearing a lot about, mostly because of the Fractured Realm. It's the five blue blue half. Uh, if a triggered ability of a permanent you control triggers, it triggers an additional time. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, doubling up on triggers. But, yeah, most of the, most of the rooms are... Here. Yeah, nothing new here. Uh, most of the rooms I feel like were fairly chill. But that one, I feel like, is still one of the more fun ones to play in general. Well, it, to me, it strikes me as odd because in Baldur's Gate, we got, I think it's White Plume Adventurer that mm-hmm. you get the initiative and you can untap one creature you control. Mm-hmm. But if you complete the dungeon, like if you complete all these steps, then you can start untapping during each other player's untap step. And then you have Drum Bellower, which is a, almost, I think, a 5 or a $6 card that untaps all your creatures during each other player's untapped step. So the fact that this is three mana, and maybe it's above a dollar now, but when I looked the first time it wasn't, I was just like, this is When I pulled it up, it was it was a do- it was a buck ten. So still yeah, very so, affordable. I mean, still crazy cheap for what its effect is. Like oh, yeah. you put this in a Selesnia deck, you put this in a Azorius deck, like anything that's gonna be untapping and tapping again. Mm-hmm. Insane. Very good. Very good. Uh, I have also lied. There's another card we probably should talk about. Um, the the big bad of the set, Valgavoth, <laughs> Terror Eater, a nine mana six black 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 for a nine nine legendary creature, Elder Demon, flying and lifelink ward. Sacrifice three non land permanents, aka hexproof. <laughs> They're like. <laughs> I some of these ward costs are getting a little bit out of hand. All right, like just put hexproof on the card. Like we get it, okay? Just give it hexproof. <laughs> no, if, see, I'm fine with the sacrifice effect as long as I'm not having to pay more mana to do it. I'll that's do fair. whatever. I'll discard a card. I'll sacrifice a legendary. I don't care. It helps me get rid of that thing. But if you're making me pay more mana to do it, instantly I'm just. No. My swords no, to plowshares no, no. costs two now? Yeah. Are you I, I can't abide me? by that. <laughs> I'll sac I'll sacrifice I'll sacrifice my nice fancy room enchantment and my one ring and one of my tokens and use a swords to plowshare instead. That's a much better trade, right? Anyway, Sometimes, you know, you got to do what you got to do to vanquish that ultimate evil. You know, Frodo lost a finger. What are you willing to lose? Uh, I don't know. I'm not three non-land permanents. Uh, if, a, <laughs> if, a card, <laughs> if, if a card you didn't control would be put into opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. Hey, that's that line of text on that ley line that's not good. Uh, as like a bonus effect on this card. Anyway, during your turn, you may play cards exiled with Valgavoth. You may, if you cast a spell this way, pay life equal to its mana value rather than pay its mana cost. A little bit of a, a little bit of like a Crick Son of Yogmoth kind of thing going on. A little bit, a little bit of life paying for casting spells. Um, mm-hmm. Only, only cards exiled with Valgavoth specifically. So you do still have to get your opponents to cast spells or remove their things to put it in, to 
that would normally send it to the graveyard to get it online. Yeah. Um, definitely terrifying if this creature hits the board, though, for sure. Oh. Mm hmm. Just, just this and a gray merchant of Asphodel, you know. <laughs> More devotion, man. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. Devotion's getting a lot of love in Duskmorn, and it's a nine mana, fl or a nine power toughness, evasive life linker. That's also going to want you to pay life to do the things. All very yeah, well this synergistic is within your legal gristle brand. Yeah, <laughs> literally though, literally. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a nice tight little package, very very synergistic with itself. Uh, but yeah, the big bad of the set definitely definitely needed to be talking about. Okay, I will I will now I will now take the hands off of the scroll wheel for this set, and I'll and we'll let Wyatt or you had you had one more. Yes, I have one more. Okay, Sam, you got anything before I? Uh, I can, I can, I'll shout out one thing. I'll choose one um, here. Let's choose a Screaming Nemesis. Ooh. It's two and a red for a 3-3 three, three spirit with haste. Whenever Screaming Nemesis is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to any other target. If a player is dealt damage this way, they can't gain life for the rest of the game. Let me tell you, I have had so much trouble. Uh, this is only minor sarcasm. I've had so much trouble with these goddamn life gain players out here just gaining life like it's nobody's <laughs> business. I needed a way to stop them. Uh, that being said, I do really. It's it's basically has an enrage effect on it. It's a stuffy doll. It's a brash taunter. It's a coal hauler swine. I love all these cards. This one has already gone in the deck with the three other cards I just mentioned. And it's ten dollar card. That's a that's a damn good value proposition. Yeah, exactly. there. card. Nicely done. They, we've had like a couple of sets now where they've been doing the you can't gain life for the rest of the game. Like there was the the one of the bad guy cards from Bloomborough was one of the the red one was when it, it you can't gain life anymore. And it's it's interesting that they're becoming more okay with these persistent effects that last throughout the entirety of the game without a way to interact with them that also aren't like an emblem or something. So, it, it's an interesting design I, space all the way around. Oh yeah, I think that's more of a response to Commander though, kind of more mm -hmm. than anything else because there's no deck in modern or standard or anything like that that has even thought to trigger, you know, infinite life. So there's yeah. no need to stop life gain. But in Commander, that's kind of an important thing. Like, let's not forget one of the original Eminence Commanders was Eloro, and everyone hated mm -hmm. it because it was just like, all right, start of the game, upkeep, I'll gain two, and I'll just do that the rest of the game. <laughs> yeah. That is true. That is true. Um, oh, no. I'm I'm gonna be a bad host again. Razorkin Needlehead. <laughs> no, there you go. I'm glad someone brought it up because it was hurting me that I wasn't gonna get to talk about it. <laughs> someone someone needed to bring up Razorkin Needlehead. So, uh, red red for a two two human assassin. It has first strike during your turn. More importantly, whenever an opponent draws a card, Razorkin Needlehead deals the damage to them. Uh, card draw is the most powerful thing in like any Magic format, basically. And we've seen similar effects to this on, like, Shieldred the Apocalypse. Uh, but at two mana and in red, it's, it's very, very juicy. I, my, my commandery brain is already, is already rife with the possibilities of, like, an Underworld Breach and, like, a Lion's Eye Diamond and, like, a Wheel of Fortune with this in play. And then just over and over and yeah. over and over and you kill everyone at the table kind of a thing like and it, this in a wheel effect is just massive damage in addition yeah. to fucking up whatever hand they've been sculpting to i it's almost a ten dollar card and it's definitely one that people are already starting to throw into some random like cedh lists as well that want to try and fight against like the ristic studies and the uh the mm -hmm. Oh my god, why am I drawing a blank on the fish? Mystic Remora. Thank you. Thank you. Good god. You're welcome. I'm, lo I'm losing it, man. Two, day two days in a row of podcasting for over an hour, and I'm losing my mind. I'm so unprofessional. Yeah, it's, it's draining, <laughs> you know? It is. And it, much like when I would draw a card with someone else having a Razorkin Needlehead, 
in play. Uh. Exactly. And we've gotten, a, I just want to throw this in there real quick. We've gotten a lot of things that do that effect. You know, Orcish mm-hmm. Bowmaster, you brought up Shieldred. Uh, Karadek Parasite was reprinted yep. in one of the Dustmorn Precons, mm-hmm. which was like a $16 card. Yeah. Um, Fate Nekusar. Unraveler is another one that draw and, yeah. uh, draw and deal damage. And then Underworld Dreams. There's so many things that do that effect, so just adding another one. So you could potentially go Karadek Parasite turn one, Needle, uh, Razorkin Needlehead turn two, turn three into uh, an Underworld Dreams, and now whenever your opponents draw their card for their turn, it's three damage. Mm-hmm. Just turn three. You're taking a lightning bolt worth of damage every time you want to draw a card. Oh yeah, and with with the prevalence of of your just card draw engines in general, and pe- people are always trying to draw more cards, and now it's like you have a clock, and then to get out of that clock, you need to dig through your deck. But to dig through your deck, you're speeding up the clock. It's just oh yeah, it's it's a vicious cycle. I believe it is. I believe Pinhead said it best. You know. Uh, no tears, please. It is a waste of good suffering. Oh, Wyatt. Oh, Wyatt. See, I think right. Nadu said it best, and uh, fuck this game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> fuck it. I'm not drawing a single card. It's being put into your hand, bitch. Um, hey, all right. tinfoil hat time. I'm pretty sure that's why Nadu had to get the axe. It's because it wasn't <laughs> drawing a card? Yep. I... Hey, like, you're just not triggering enough stuff. I bad not this is bad. This is completely off topic, but it had to it had to just be because of the play pattern and just taking forever to resolve it, right? Like that's that's right. the same reason they've gotten rid of other things. Um mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah, no. I I miss I already miss Nadu Summer already. It's heartbreaking. It's it was heartbreaking. a short, short, you know, brief time in the sun. Very brief. <laughs> very, but very now brief. to bring us back to spooky things. Ooh. Yeah, spooky. I'm gonna bring up Nadu, Nadu's card. very spoopy. <laughs> Uh, he was, and he's now very he's banned. Spooky. And he's banned and in almost every format. Like literally, that's how spooky he was. He's legal in like the two that basically don't ban anything. Mm-hmm. All right, what do you got, Man, Wyatt? Take us home. We're really surprised when that got called out. But uh, right. the last one I'm going to bring up is I mentioned him earlier. I did a deck tech on him, Tyvar the Pummeler. I love Tyvar the Pummeler from this set specifically because it kind of fits into this elf ball because all elf commanders do similar things you know you're Mm -hmm. gonna make a bunch of mana so you can activate an ability an infinite number of times and you'll win that way what i like about tyvar is you only need one or two at most activations so you don't have to generate infinite mana just generating a lot will get you to where you need to go and there's so many cards that I found while building the deck that are like, when this creature attacks, give its power to something else. So basically, mm-hmm. it's like this step stool of you give one boost, and then you attack. And now all these things start stacking their power and toughness, and then when they finally reach the pinnacle, you activate one more time, and now the whole team has the boost, and it's just coming in crazy dude your your deck tech video on this was very very good and i'm the the number of super cheap super efficient mana dorks that are going to be tapping for loads of mana to be able to pump this thing to sometimes three times and that stacking is yeah tyvar tyvar is is scary for sure once you get into combat and uh, you're able to give them indestructible, so a lot of des- destroy-based mm-hmm. effects, destroy board wipes, are are not going to be very helpful in getting rid of that guy. No. Yeah. It ju- it's one of those things that as you play creatures, he just gets better, because you're basically banking indestructible spells. Oh, yeah. So... you And you swing... And like you said, he's a massive threat in combat, because you could just swing with him. And now your opponents are like, okay, well, I either have to block it, or may, maybe I'll let it go through, because he's got five mana, he can only pump one time, but, you know, maybe you have a couple combat tricks or something, and now combat tricks. the whole team's big. And and 
It's just Be- because of all the pump effects that are going on in that deck. I mean, you can't really risk not blocking it because if he gets pumped five, six, seven, like you're taking a lot of commander damage, which is going to even speed up this yeah. damage clock itself. And yeah, Tyvar, Tyvar is very, very fun. Um, all right, so those are kind of the the big cards we wanted to call out. We've been going a little over an hour at this point. Do you guys have any final thoughts for Duskmorn? I know, I know, why you were thinking this was probably going to be the best set of the year, and in some ways, I think you're right. But it for me, I still think, think Bloomborough so. is is the big one of the year. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to compete with cute woodland creatures. Mm-hmm. You know, I I fully get that. But like I said at the beginning, I think that this set is going to be one of those sets that's either someone's... It's either going to be a large group of people's absolute favorite, and I know a huge group won't like it because it, it's getting too realistic, I've heard. Uh, a lot yeah. of people complaining about, like, the TVs and the Walkmans mm-hmm. and the chainsaws and all this other stuff. But to me... It's all just so perfectly wrapped in in everything I really enjoy. Like I've never purchased a secret layer. Mm-hmm. I'm buying the Ghostbuster secret layer. <laughs> I'm buying the Chucky secret layer. Like this is one set where I might have to just drop enough money to get the super drop and and just get everything because I just can't get enough. I can't get enough dust mourn in my veins, man. Inject it's, it it's in. So good. <laughs> Sam, what's your Straight. what's your <laughs> Sam, what's your what's your your vibe on Duskmorn? What's the final the final verdict? Uh, I really like Duskmorn. Um, you know, as as much as I'm not a horror fan, I'm a weird uh, the I'm the 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 weird stepbrother of horror, which is weird uh, uh, creepy stuff fan. <laughs> Wyatt, he's tried to talk, Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm letting him We're, talk. There's He's only so many, more things. There's so this much is memorabilia. The watch. There's so much memorabilia. The watch. They'll enjoy it. <laughs> just keep going. Keep going. Um, I I love the synergies in the set between all of the is different. Is that a GameCube uh, game? What enchanted... is that? <laughs> Wait, what, 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 what is little, that disc? A little Zool pin. Oh, okay. Zool. I saw a hole in the middle. Uh-huh. I was like, is that a GameCube disc? It's so small. <laughs> this is just going to be a treat for you uh, for you watching stuff. the podcast. So, oh you know, my go god! Go watch the podcast. Yeah, go check out go check out the podcast on YouTube.com. Keep, 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 keep 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 going. YouTube.com slash the Ginger Bros for this. Good God, Sam. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> okay. Oh my god! Does it end? It just keeps coming. It doesn't. When I said I love Ghostbusters, I was not exaggerating. (laughs) All right, um, (laughs) moving on. The listening audience, the listening only audience, is like, what the, what the hell? What is going on? uh, He he was pulling out memorabilia for seven and a half minutes. What? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Go check it out on YouTube. So obviously the, (laughs) yeah, you should go check it out on YouTube. Uh, Bye, Wyatt. Okay. Wait, wait. Um, <laughs> Why is he oh, running no, away? I'll keep, oh, God. Yeah, just keep going. Don't worry about uh, it. Uh, I hope all it right, makes a noise. So, obviously, it doesn't make a noise. No, they don't make noise. <sighs> they should, but I took the batteries out. Well, now I'm just disappointed. All right, all right. <laughs> I'm, I have more, but I'm not going to do it to you. I love I love the committing to the bit, right but there. Sam, we gotta close this out. Let's go. What we got? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, there are so many enchantment things in here, and yeah. obviously enchantments is already a very popular archetype. But now they're giving us new ways to play it, and in new colors with uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the blue enchantment stuff. Um, the rooms themselves are ne- maybe not the greatest, but I can't imagine we won't see those again. I'll say that better. I can imagine we'll see those again in future sets, and uh, and uh, yeah, I I really like this set, and I think that so uh, we are planning on doing a little uh, uh, 2024 limited uh, game towards the end of the year once all the sets yes, are out, yes. and I can imagine that 
whatever you pull, whatever we, you know, a pack of each, of each set that's come out this year, whatever is pulled from Duskmorn is going to be a great role player in whatever, you know, archetype or whatever uh, uh, meta you end up uh, building in. Yeah, Duskmorn oh, yeah. Duskworn has a lot of great so cards. Well with other sets. It's going to be one yeah. of those, like, glue cards that kind of holds everything else together. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. If we had like normal, like a normal standard rotation, it would be really, really useful. For, I mean, it already is still really useful for them. Um, but yeah, Duskborn, a lot of good stuff in in our end of year limited environment. I, I think Duskborn and uh, Modern Horizons three. If you get some mm-hmm. kind of synergy between those two packs, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be able to figure like you're gonna be able to build around those two specifically. Uh, for these limited decks. Um, oh, just imagine, like, Manifest, Dread, and Kozilek from Modern Horizons. Like, <laughs> I don't want to. Uh, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> as far as the 2024 sets go this year, I can't imagine that Foundations is going to be better than this. I think the floor on Foundations is going to be pretty good. The ceiling's going to be pretty low, too. Um, Duskmorn, I would say, is probably... This is my second favorite set of the year, even though I'm not like a like a, a horror movie person. Just the card quality is so diverse and so and so good. Um, I still think Bloomboro is going to be end up being my favorite set of the year because I like the theme of it and the card quality. Uh, mm-hmm. But you can't deny what what they did. The design team did with this set. I think it was really really good. Very thematic. They hit they hit the nail on the head in in so many ways. Uh, for people that are into that sort of thing, which I am not, which is no. why we have Wyatt here <laughs> to sing the praises <laughs> properly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, that is you know, all we have. Oh, what do you? You got a final thought? Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, much like the Ghostbusters, Duskmorn Bustin makes me feel good. So <laughs> Bustin makes me feel good. <laughs> Bustin, 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 Bustin. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you again for joining us on this episode of Bonus Action, a Duels and Mana Dorks supplement podcast. These come out whenever the hell we record them. The regular episodes come out every other week. You can get it early and ad-free on Patreon. Uh, you can also get the Bonus Action episodes that we do on Patreon. Those are free to literally anyone on the Patreon, so you can go check it out there. Uh, Wyatt, Typical Gemini, thank you so much for joining us again uh, you're always you're always a pleasure to have, and I didn't know you had that much Ghostbusters memorabilia. I, you you're putting you're putting to shame my own Lord of the Rings memorabilia in some ways, oh, which well, is it's it's been an obsession of mine for a long time. Like when I was five or six, my dad mm-hmm. made like a business card for me that said I was a Ghostbuster. I still have it around here somewhere. Uh, I love that. It's just something that's always stuck with me, so when they started announcing the set, I was like, oh, this looks a lot like Ghostbusters, and then they drop more stuff that's 80s horror, and then they drop the secret layer, so just, <laughs> mm-hmm. there's so much about this set that really just talks to me, and as you can see through all the stuff, I just really love Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is very true. That is very true. Thank you so much for joining us, Wyatt. Uh, you can find Wyatt Thank you so on, much for having me. on all of the social medias. Typical Gemini on YouTube for amazing deck techs that are like five cents sometimes, so that's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> you should, whoa, okay, whoa, ult- whoa. ultimate deck tech challenge here. One dollar commander deck. You only get one dollar. You have to like go to a convention and like scavenge like card. the 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 discard piles of things from people that are just getting rid of shit at like the land stations and assemble something there it's a great video idea highly recommend you let it come you let something <laughs> like that come close enough to where i live i will see it done <laughs> fair very fair sam of course thank you for joining me as as we always do on this the duels and manadors podcast um we'll see you again for for the regular episode very very soon we love you very much and as always 